All right, good morning. I think we have Bill already, so we'll go ahead and get started. I think you have a worksheet there, that's for chapter 17, that we're going to be today. Last week we got through most of 16. I'm going to just sprint through 16 again, just to reorient people that weren't here. But last week we talked about the seven bowls of wrath in Revelation 16. And in Revelation 16, there are seven bowls of wrath that are poured out in Rome as a result of their punishment toward God. But Revelation 16 is different from the other punishments we've seen before, whereas previously the punishments have been partial. You hear about three-fourths of the earth being burned up and that sort of thing. When you get to Revelation 16, the punishment is complete, total, and it is final. It's certain. There's no turning back. So just quickly, here are the seven bowls. I just backed up here just to go over what these are. But anyway, bowl one, harmful swords on the people. And what you see in the seven bowls of wrath are a lot of parallels to the plagues that took place in Egypt. So bowl one, there are harmful swords on the people who align with the beast, which is kind of ironic because in earlier chapters, you remember people received the mark of the what? The beast. They wanted to be marked, but now they'll be marked in a different way with the swords that will come on the people. Bowl number two, the sea became like blood, dead corpse, everything in the sea died, and that's reminiscent of one of the seven plagues. Rivers became like blood, you remember that from Exodus chapters eight and nine. Bowl number four, the sun scorched people like fire, and then bowl number five, there is the darkness. And that's kind of where we left off last week, but I'm gonna go ahead and finish these for this morning. Bowl number six, the great river Euphrates is dried up. That is a phrase that's used throughout the Old Testament to talk about God stopping traffic flow from people escaping punishment. So in Jeremiah 50, when God wants to say, hey, I'm done with Israel, I'm going to dry up the Euphrates River and the Babylonians will come. God saying there'll be no place to flee to or escape from. There is Revelation 16, 15, a beatitude from Jesus. In the book of Revelation, there are seven of these beatitudes or blessed statements. Revelation 1, 3, blessed is the one that reads aloud the words of this prophecy and keeps it. Or Revelation 14, 13, blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from now on. And here is another one of the seven, Revelation 16, 15, where John says, behold, I come as a thief. Or Jesus says this, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that keeps himself spotless and pure and that he might have a garment and not walk about naked. And so in Revelation 16, 15, Jesus describes himself as coming as a thief. We talk about some of what that means. Then there is the famous Battle of Armageddon, and there are books about Armageddon. People make movies about it, but John didn't say a lot about it. In Revelation 16, 16, he mentions that there will be a battle, and it's really not going to be a battle. When you read chapter 19, it's just going to be the defeat of God's people trampling over and triumphing over the Romans. And so people have had all kind of fictional ideas on what the Battle of Armageddon is all about. What John does here is he just picks up an Old Testament image, the place of Megiddo, which would be what Armageddon is in Hebrew. The place of Megiddo is where a lot of battles were fought in the Old Testament. Probably the most popular one would be Deborah and Barak of Judges 4 and 5. And a lot of times God's people were routed in Megiddo. Sometimes they were successful. John, as he's been doing all along, dips back into his Old Testament archives, lifts up this phrase, talks about a battle that's going to take place, but there won't be any back and forth battle. Because the seven bowls of wrath signify God's complete destruction of Rome. And then the seventh bowl pours the bowl into the air. Remember, what is the devil called in Ephesians 2 and verse 2? Paul says he's the prince of the power of the what? Of the air. And so this last bowl comes out and it's basically about the whole atmosphere. Everything that Satan believes he controls is ultimately going to be upended by God. So let's do the hearing and keeping of Revelation 15, 16, where we get the practical ideas from these two chapters from last week, and then we'll deal with the worksheet that's in your hands, okay? Some of y'all have gotten smart enough to keep the worksheet from last week, so good for you the rest, I'm sorry. All right, so here we go. Here and keeping Revelation 15 and 16. Here's number one. Remember the singing the song of Moses and the Lamb now. In Revelation 15, when the people come out of this great persecution, it says that they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb, which is really a song of triumph throughout the Bible. In Exodus 15, when the people come out of um, Egypt and they come through the Red Sea, they sing the song of Moses. Here it's the same idea. They sing the song of Moses and it's a song of victory. And for us, the practical side of this is to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb right now. There's a sense in which we already have conquered, right? Romans 8.37, Paul says we are more than what? 
conquerors. And we should be singing the song of Moses and the Lamb now. When we think about worship, and the book of Revelation causes you to think about this a lot because worship is one of the big themes of John's apocalypse, one of the ideas we need to consider is the worship we engage with on earth is supposed to mirror the worship that's taking place in heaven. So this life, especially worship, is the grand rehearsal for what's going to take place in heaven. So sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Now Paul says we speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart. One of the reasons we do that is in gratitude of what God's already done. And so we should do that now. Here's number two. God is going to pour out his wrath on the wicked. He's already, he's either pouring out his wrath on the wicked or he's preparing to do so. And we just need to make sure we're not caught in God's way. The seven bowls of wrath in chapter 16 are going to be poured out on who specifically in the context of the book of Revelation? On who? The Romans, yes. And some people get to Revelation 16 and they think, well, no, this is in time. It's about the Romans. But we also need to see every punishment in the book of Revelation, every one of them, is a metaphor or a type of the final punishment that's going to come out on all wicked people at the end of time. And so we see John saying God's pouring out his wrath. And we just need to appreciate about the God we serve. When we see wickedness in our world, only two options. One, God has poured out his wrath on the wicked now in some way, shape, or form, or he's preparing to do so. But he's never just idle, doing nothing about it. And the book of Revelation tells us that, that God is in control. Number three, those who stand with the Lamb will escape the wrath that are poured out on all people. And 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9 says, God has not appointed you to wrath, but to obtain salvation. And so the wrath that you read about in the book of Revelation, don't be afraid of it. And I hope 16 chapters in, we've got about four more classes to go. I hope the fear of reading this book has been stripped away from us. And we think more about, listen, if I'm with the Lamb, none of the terrible things that I read about in Revelation are directed at me. At the end of chapter 6, John poses this question. The great day of his wrath has come, and who will be able to stand? What's the answer to that question? Christians, it's in chapter 7, those that are sealed. And so... The wrath that you see in Revelation 16, I know it sounds terrible, like the world's on fire and all of that. It is for the wicked, but not for the Christian. The most important thing we can do in light of judgment is not fear necessarily the punishment that's to come, but to prepare ourselves to be standing with God and not be found in the way of his wrath. God is just and holy. When you read about the punishment of Revelation 16, don't shrink back from it and think this makes God unloving or unrighteous. God does what is right perfect, just, and fair. He always does. One quick passage. Go to 2 Thessalonians. I know we're in Revelation, but go to 2 Thessalonians, please, and notice what Paul says about why God needs to be just in the judge. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we'll start at verse 7. Well, we'll just go back up to verse 5. This is important. When you think about judgment and who God is, 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5 says, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed, verse 6, God considers it what? What does your translation have? <laughs> righteous or just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief with those who are afflicted with us as well. And then he talks about the Lord Jesus being revealed from heaven with fire with his mighty angels taking vengeance on those that don't know God. And that don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what I wanted us to underscore there in relation to Revelation is it is just and right for God to judge and pour out his wrath on the wicked. It's a right thing for God to do. And he's not the God of the Bible if he doesn't do that. And so Revelation 16 helps us with that. And then the last thing is Jesus describes himself as coming back as a what? Behold, I come as a what? As a thief. What does that signify about the return of Jesus? When he says, I come as a thief, what is he saying to us about his return? It's going to be a what? Surprise. Is it going to be a surprise, though? Well, yeah, Jesus said it is, right? There's a sense in which it's going to be a surprise, but also, when Jesus keeps saying, I'm coming as a thief, what is he also trying to do? At the same time, he's saying, there's an element of surprise to my return. He also wants us to be what? Be prepared. If he's going to come as a thief, then just be what? Be ready. And then whenever he comes, he'll come as a thief for the unprepared. But for the Christian, when Jesus returns, Christians should say, this is the day I've been waiting for my whole life. Not, oh my, I've got unfinished business. Or I really want to do this other thing. Or I hope he doesn't come today. When Jesus returns, the Christian should say, this is the thing I've been living for my whole life. And now 
was finally called upon. Faith has vanished in sight. Hope has disappeared in reality. And so we should expect it and be ready. All right. Now for the worship. Here's chapter 17. Chapter 17, John is going to zoom in on the one responsible for persecuting the church, which is Rome. John has used several metaphors so far in Revelation to talk about the church's opposition. But in Revelation 17 and into chapter 18, he's going to use one of the Old Testament's favorite ways to refer to God's people or God's enemies. Two of God's favorite ways in the Old Testament. John's going to use them here. You need to get a handle, and we need to get a handle on chapter 17 and what John describes. Because when we get to chapters 21 and 22 at the end, the heavenly scenes and chapters, what John is going to do, he's going to do it from here forward. But just so we don't get confused, we need a handle on what John's doing in 17 so we don't fast forward in 21 and make John say things he's not saying. So John's going to eventually describe two different women, two different scenes, and there's a compare and contrast going on, and a careful reading of 17 helps us later on in the book. So this is helpful. I've been stressing throughout the class that John said the things that he is writing about will come to pass when? Soon. And that's what he says in chapter 1 and verse 1, chapter 1 and verse 3, chapter 3, 11, 22, 6, 22, 7, and a host of other passages. And so these things come to pass in the days of the Roman Empire at some point in the future. But I also want us to appreciate that what John says about Babylon here and about Rome will eventually happen to every earthly kingdom. Every earthly kingdom will eventually crumble. So don't read Revelation and only think about Rome in the first century and say, Woo, I'm glad that's got nothing to do with us. There is something that is saying to us, and that is what you see here has something to say to every kingdom. And I had this lesson done before the event taking place in Israel right now, but it's interesting to think about it from this point. I don't know if you're a news watcher or not, I'm really not, but if you're the kind of person that when calamity happens in the world, or you get a sense that, oh my, there could be a war, a war, a war of some kind, or some kind of earthly calamity with our nation or another nation, if that puts a knot in your stomach, I'm not saying that we despise ungodliness, we should. It should always make us weep with those that weep. But I mean, if you feel a sort of trepidation as evil people encroach on our society or any democracy or any place in the world, and you start to feel uneasy, like things are kind of getting out of control, we need a deep dose of Revelation 17 and 18, because what John's reminding us of is this reality. Though wickedness often parades itself as successful, beautiful, and free, it's on a shaky and crumbling foundation. The sovereign God of the Bible will reign and rule, and Christians have nothing to fear. So that pit in our stomach, those butterflies that we get when we feel like our freedom and liberty or whatever may be in danger. For the Christian, that's just not our reality. If we really believe the Bible, and John wants Christians to get this reality in their system, so nothing that we see out here can ultimately cause us to fear, but instead they'll be different to trust in God through who he is. All right, Revelation 17, let's read the first six verses. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. All right. So John opens up his eyes here. One of the angels who had the seven bowls in chapter 16 comes to show John the one he describes as the great prostitute seated on many waters. John's going to tell us who this is. Revelation 17 is helpful in this regard. It's one of the major chapters where John explains a lot of the visions, or the angel will at the end of 17 to John. So I told, us, told you before, whenever you have this in Revelation, where God or John or an angel says this represents that, it just takes away the guesswork. We ought to believe them. John is shown this prostitute here. She's described as one that the kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with. Notice verse 2. And with the wine of sexual immorality, they become drunk. John has referred to Rome as a lot of things. Somebody help me out with some of the ways before chapter 17. So don't use anything in 17 yet. How has John referred to Rome throughout the book so far? 
What was that? I said, don't use anything from 17 years. <laughs> yeah, Babylon has been earlier, though. But yes, Babylon, that's one. What about, what else? What does John say? A beast? What does a beast signify? Terror, control, power. But now John uses what image in verse 1? She's a great what? Rome is a great what? The judgment of the great harlot or prostitute. Why does John use this image? And what is it designed to communicate about the Roman Empire? Why would John call Rome a great harlot or a great prostitute? What does that mean? Immoral. Immoral? Oh, go ahead. Enticing, yeah, that's important. So, so far, Rome has just been bulldozing everybody with their power. But when John says she's a prostitute or a harlot, He's saying he's lulled the nations. Rome has kind of drawn people in and enticed the people. Notice a few of these, and Gary, you are right. It does show up before this. Look at Revelation 14. Revelation 14, and for people who just like to, um, maybe if you like to write in your Bible or something like that, you'll see some of these. Revelation 14 and verse number Verse number eight, she's not necessarily called a harlot here, but it's the same idea. Another angel, a second followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And so this word for prostitute or harlot is used to refer throughout the Old, the New Testament at least, to a political entity, entity that's against God's people. That's how this word is used. Here, the political entity is Rome, and they're ultimately against God's people. The image of a prostitute or a harlot deals with unfaithfulness. Throughout the Old Testament, sometimes Jerusalem is described as being a harlot toward God. And here, that's what you have with the Romans. So, John's carried off into the wilderness. That's 17.3. The Spirit carries him off into the wilderness. He saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. It has seven heads and <coughs> ten horns. So, the woman is arrayed in all of these different jewels. If you notice in verse number 3 and 4, Look at verse 4. The woman is arrayed in purple, scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. I'm telling you, when you get to Revelation 21 and you see this city coming down out of heaven, and John describes it as having jasper and jewels and gold and pearls, what John's doing in 21 is he's comparing the true beautiful woman, which he's going to call the bride of Christ in Revelation 21.9, with the false beauty of the Roman Empire that appeared to be beautiful and gorgeous, but was actually not any of those things. And so the uh, handle of chapter 17 just shows you what John's setting up later for chapter 21. But notice, why does John say all of these things? What does this description in verse 4 tell us about the woman? Andrew hinted at it a moment ago. What did you say, Andrew, about this image of the woman? It's enticing. Yeah, that's right. It's enticing. Rome would have been enticing to all of the surrounding nations. She appeared to be prosperous, successful, and luxurious. But what John shows us here is... She's guilty of immorality, fornication, and sin. She has blasphemous names written on her and is ultimately anti-God. And John describes her as on her way down. Hold your hand in Revelation 17. Go to Isaiah 14. This is not the first time that a nation has been described this way. Isaiah 14. And I know Isaiah 14 has typically been used to talk about the fall of Satan. And um, there might be some things true about the fall of Satan in Isaiah 14. But that's not who Isaiah is talking about. If you've got a heading in your Bible in Isaiah 14, verse 3, it probably says something about what nation? Babylon. That's what he's talking about. And if you notice Isaiah 14, look at verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How are you cut down to the ground? You who laid the nations low, you who said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is the man who made the earth, is this the man who made the earth to tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew through its cities? who did not let his prisoners go home. And so when Babylon appeared to be successful, God says through Isaiah, she's ultimately cast down. The same thing is true about Rome. She appeared to be unstoppable, impenetrable, successful. But John says, actually, she's a prostitute who lures the nations with the wine of her intoxication and immorality. But she'll fall as a result of those very things. The woman is referred to as Babylon the Great. Notice Revelation 17, 5. 
on her head was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother, mother of prostitutes and earth's abomination. When you think about the term Babylon in the Bible, what do you think about? The Tower of Babel. Of Babel. Yeah. Go to Genesis 11. We call it the Tower of Babel, and that's how most of our English translations render it. But everywhere else that word appears is Babylon throughout the Bible. It's always Babylon. We call it Babel, but what happens in Genesis 11 sets up the trajectory for the rest of what we see in the Bible. So Genesis 11 and I'm just going to read the first nine verses here to talk about why Babylon is important. It has a rich history in the Old Testament, and it's carried into the New Testament to describe nations like Rome. Genesis chapter 11 and verse number, number one. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words, and as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks, burn them thoroughly, and they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, they all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they'll do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from one another over the face of the whole earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, the name of the city is called Babel. That should be Babylon. But because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. What does that, what's wrong with this in Genesis 11? Why does God disperse them everywhere? Because they want to do what? Build a tower? Well, not, I mean, is God really against construction projects? No, right? Why does God want to disperse them over this construction project, though? They're putting themselves first and what they can accomplish and what they can do. And if you notice, if you're still in Genesis 11, go over to Genesis 12 and notice these contrasts. Genesis 12 and Genesis 11. At the same time, if you can see these passages, God says in Genesis 12 and verse 1 to Abraham, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all families of the earth will be blessed. If you go back to Genesis chapter 11, notice verse 4. They said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top. Let us make a name for ourselves. You see the contrast? People that have the spirit of Babylon say, let me make myself great and make a name for myself and be successful. But people that are of the seed of Abraham say, let God make my name great. Let him make me a blessing. And from Genesis 11 through Revelation 22, everybody in the world, even now, is this, they're either in Genesis 11 in the way they live their lives or Genesis chapter 12. Everybody either has a Babylonian spirit that says, I'm going to exalt myself. I'm going to make my name great. I'm going to be the person that I can be just through human effort. Or you're at the seat of Abraham and you let God do the making of your name great. And throughout the Bible, Babylon is used to point back to this scene. There is a literal nation of Babylon in the Old Testament. But when Israel misbehaves, God says, you remind me of Babylon. In 1 Peter 5, 13, Peter talks about Rome and he says, her name is Babylon. And everybody in the world is either in Babylon or in the seed of Abraham, either making a name for themselves or letting God exalt their name. And that's what Rome is doing. And John sees all these things that's described about Rome in Revelation 17. And in verse 6 it says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints of the martyrs, of the blood of Jesus, and when I saw her, I marveled greatly. So John sees this great description of the woman. And John's amazed, all these things that are said about the woman. Why would John be surprised when he saw this image of Rome, this woman with blasphemous names on her forehead, she has this cup of wine, figuratively speaking, and the nations get drunk on her. Why would John be amazed in verse 6? What would make John amazed about what he saw with the woman? Kevin wants to jump in here. Let's let's blow up little man. Why? Because that's probably not what he's seeing in real life as he's living around those cities and that area. As far as what? Like he's probably not seeing what? He's not seeing how it really is. 
Yeah, it doesn't and seem like Rome is kind of real. I think that's right. Yeah, Rome is really corrupt and wicked. It doesn't appear that way on the face of it. Seems like things are peaceful. The Romans had something called Pax Romana. You can look this up sometime, but Rome was all for the peace of Rome. No wars, no problems. That's why you read in the book of Acts, if they bring Paul or somebody up for a trial, the thing the governors want to do first is get things squashed. They don't want any problems. That's why Pilate eventually washes his hands of Jesus and says, hey, I don't want this happening in my jurisdiction. You take them and do a court of your law. The Romans want a peace above anything else. And so, as Kevin mentioned, from what John was seeing in daily life, it looked like Rome was wicked, corrupt, evil, a political harlot. But when God draws the curtain back, he says, this is what I really see. And John marvels, and John's surprised, but the angel's going to come along and say, John has no reason to be. Let's look at verses 7 down to verse 14. The angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. The dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, they will mark or see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. So underline that because that's one where John tells you what that's all about. Verse 10, there are also seven kings, five of whom are fallen. One is, the other has not yet come, and the one who does come, he must remain only a little while. And as for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. The ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Okay. <coughs> verse 7, John says some things. Verse, verse 7 and 8, John says some, the angel says some things to John. Notice, John, why are you surprised? I'm going to tell you the mystery of the woman. So, as Kevin mentioned, John's probably scratching his head because what the angel reveals about Rome isn't what John thinks he sees about Rome. I'll give you an example. Sometimes, well, I went to Ghana in 2017 on a mission trip, and one night I was preaching at this church, and when it was all said and done, the worship service was over, and I was waiting on my ride to come and pick me up. The guys that went on this trip with me, we all went to different congregations, and I was there standing in the road with this guy from Ghana, and uh, it was just me and him. It was pretty dark at this time, and he was asking me about America, and we were talking back and forth, and he said to me, you know, the image that we have of America is pretty different from what you're telling me about America. He said, in America, we've been told over here that, like, there are just dollar bills on the ground. Like, I said, no, I wish. That were the case. You know, he said, no, like, y'all just throw one dollar bills out. Like, nobody cares about it. I said, that is not the true and real version of America. There are poor people in America just like here. Of course, there are varying levels, but, like, don't believe what you've seen on TV. And so John's staring at this image of this woman. He's blown away. And the angel says, no, John, I'm going to give you the mystery of the woman. You won't be alarmed anymore. And here's what John says starting in verse number number seven. I'll tell you the mystery of the woman. She had the seven heads and ten horns that carries her. Verse eight. The beast that you saw, who is the beast? Not a trick question. Who is the beast? Rome. Correct, Rachel. Rome. All right, so the beast that he saw was and is not and is about to rise. What is that about? I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. Verses eight through 11 are some of the hardest in the book, but he says that this beast was, is not in about to rise. What do you think that means for Rome? Rome was, is not, but it's coming back again. What does that sound like to you? What does that mean about Rome? Instability. Instability. Exactly. Exactly. So instability. So Rome was successful. Occasionally throughout the book, you might argue that the persecution maybe wasn't as fierce for Christians, so is not, but it's coming back again. It is about to rise. So there's going to be more persecution. The people love to look on the beast. You see that in verse number eight. Verse number nine, John says, or the angel tells him, this calls for a mountain of wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Now, in John's day, Rome was a world-renowned city that sat on seven hills. This is kind of undebated. It's undisputed. Any historical reference will give you this. When people talk about Rome, they talk about the seven hills that she sat on. If you read some of the Greek literature from this time period about Rome in their own writings, Cicero and other people, they describe Rome as sitting on seven hills. If you just Google, not right now in my class, but if you Google um, coins in Rome, 
you'll see these images of these seven hills and seven mountains. And so that this woman, the prostitute that John saw, is seated on seven hills, he's saying Rome is seated in this exalted position, or at least appears to be. So that's really not up for debate. But then there's verses 10 through 11, which are the most debated verses in all the book. Because you've got this description of these kings or these individuals in verse number 10. Notice, there are seven kings, five, five of whom are fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. So you've got five fallen, one is, the other is yet to come. People have all kinds of views. I'm going to give you the two most prominent views and then a possible solution to the dilemma. So people figure, if we can figure out who these individuals are, it's going to help us to date the book of Revelation. And your view of the date, I've talked to some people in the class that don't agree with my date, but they say, hey, here's why, because they get to this part of the text and they've got a different idea. There are two major views on how to deal with these five were, one is, and one is to come. Option number one, people say it's not about kings at all, it's about empires. And they go back to the book of Daniel, and Daniel saw this vision, and Daniel saw these different empires, and they say, hey, these empires are represented here, and here's the ones they'll say. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, Greece, and Rome. And then they'll talk about the Roman Empire under Constantine, and another time when the Roman Empire is going to rise to significance again. The problem is, this is for Revelation and not Daniel. While John does sometimes borrow from Daniel, he's not mimicking exactly what Daniel's doing, and we shouldn't force that on him. But the second and probably the most prominent view is to say these seven individuals represent seven emperors throughout Rome. And then people get funny with who they want to put in the seven. Here's one list. Some people say this is where you start. Augustus or Octavian, Tiberius, Caliguia, that's a good name for these years. Caliguia, Nero, Vespasian, <laughs> Titus, and Domitian. And people are like, there you go, there are your seven guys. The problem is, there were three Roman emperors that reigned in quick succession, back to back, from AD 68 through 69, Galba, Alto, and Metellius. And they're like, well, we're not going to count those guys because like, they didn't reign long enough, so maybe John skipped them. And another thing, we don't really know where to start the emperor. Because Julius Caesar is also called an emperor, the first in Rome. However you try to do this with Roman emperors, you're going to have to do funny math, and it just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. The empires don't fit, and my argument is the emperors themselves don't fit. So what are we left with? What is John telling us? Read the text again. Let's just read it and see what John actually says. He says, there are seven kings, five of whom who are fallen. One is, the other is not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. That really doesn't give you much to work with. But here's what I would be thinking. So far in the book of Revelation, has John used literal numbers or figures? Nine times out of 10, figures. So why don't we press John now to have to be dealing with literal numbers? Maybe what John is saying, and I believe this is the most sensible um, solution to this conundrum, and that is perhaps John's just describing Rome's rule and empire in totality, using the number seven to speak of the total reign of Romans. And the message of the angel to John is this, Forget the math. Who cares who these guys were? What's going to happen to them in the end anyway? They're going to be destroyed and they're going down. And I, I think that's what John's saying. If John is speaking of literal emperors, nobody living today, no scholar or commentator on Revelation can figure it out. The people in John's day would have known. Here's what we know. Whoever they were, they've been dead a long time. Okay? That's it. And they were destroyed because of their opposition to persecution to Christians. And so... If your view of Revelation depends on figuring this out to date Vespasian as the guy, or Nero, or even Domitian, who, is, who I think was the emperor at the time, it's just a faulty thing to base your interpretation on because nobody can know that for sure. So that's that. And then John mentions 10 kings. Notice that in verse number, where is that, the 10 kings? Verse 12. Who are these 10 kings? These probably represent sub-rulers throughout the Roman Empire. These governors, they kind of babysat for Rome. You read in the gospel accounts, who was in charge when Jesus was born? Herod. You think about Herod and some of these guys, they babysat these different parts in the Roman Empire for the Romans. And here John says in verse 12, the 10 horns that you saw represent 10 kings. They have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. So throughout the book of Acts and throughout the gospels, these kings, these sub-rulers would babysit different areas throughout the Roman Empire and it was their job to make sure the beast got his due. Don't disrespect the emperor. What do they tell Pilate when he's not going to crucify Jesus? They say, if you don't do this, you're no friend of who? Caesar. He's one of the kings. He's one of the succors, so to speak. He's got to go along with everything. And so 
John describes them here as well. But here's what I want you to see. Go to verse 14. What's the end for all of these folks? They will do what? Make war with the lamb. And what will happen to them? The lamb will conquer them. Here's my question. Stay with verse 14. Just read verse 14 to yourself and answer this question. Why does John know? How is John sure that the lamb will conquer them? What's his reason in verse 14? Because Jesus is what? Or who? Lord of lords and king of kings. Now, if you write in your Bible, here's some cross references where that phrase appears again. It comes up in Revelation 19, 16. And it comes up again in 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. Jesus is the blessed and only potentate, Paul says, the king of kings and lord of lords. All right. What does that mean? When you read that in the Bible, somebody is Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. What does that mean? Why does John say that about Jesus or Paul for that matter? What does it mean that Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords? He's supreme and no other. Yes. The ultimate ruler. Worthy. All. Yeah, I think that's another part of it, Russell. We don't need to leave that out. One day, everybody who's ever lived is going to do what before Jesus? Bow. Who's going to be included in that number? Kings and other lords. Everybody. Who did the Romans think was in charge of the world? Who? The emperor. Who do people think is in charge today? There's a long list. But when the Bible says Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords, it means, and we've said this before, if you put all the kings who've ever existed in the world of Jesus, they will bow before him. People that have received patronage and taxes and people just crumble before them or just can't wait to shake their hand if they appear in the room of Jesus, they will bow to every Lord who's ever lived. And these absolute monarchs who have terrorized the world before Jesus, they will bow as well. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the last part of verse 14 says, and those with him are the called, chosen, and faithful. So those with them, who are these folks at the end of 14? Christians. Let's just go through these three phrases quickly. Verse 14 says, those with him are the called. When and how are we called? When does that happen? When you hear and obey the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Um, here's another question. Who does God call? Everybody. So why in the Bible sometimes like Romans 8, 29 through 30, and people get tripped up with this. Sometimes it sounds like in the Bible, God's only called a specific group of people. Why Does that ever occur to you when you read the Bible? It's like, well, these people are called and they're predetermined. And it seems like God's called a specific group of people. Why is that the case? Why does it sound like that? Jonah, those are the ones that follow him. That's important. In the Bible, in the New Testament, when the Bible talks about people that are called, it's not talking about the people that are invited. It's talking about the only people that actually answer the call. Whenever you read of election in the Bible or called, it's not talking about the ones God sent the invitations to. That's everybody in the whole world. But in the Bible, when the Bible speaks of these individuals are being, as being called, it's saying these are the only people who have favorably responded to God's invitation. And because of that, Acts 2.21, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, they're the call. They've received it. But it's not like God's predetermined a significant number of people and said only these people will be called. <laughs> they're the call because they're the ones that have responded favorably. John also says that we're chosen. What does it mean to be chosen? It means to be selected. And God, before time, he predetermined a plan, but not individual people. And these individuals are chosen and then faithful. So that speaks for itself. Notice what's said about these folks at the end of verse 14. They're with him. And this is important. Um, maybe you've been somewhere before and you went with somebody and you were in a place that you really didn't fit in or didn't have any place being. But in the end, you were welcomed in because you could say, I'm with him, I'm with this person. When you and I get to heaven, this won't happen. But if it did, if there was an angel in heaven that looked at you and me and thought, what are you doing here? The only thing we'd be able to say is, I'm with him. And that's what John says. They conquer because he conquers. In verse 14, the chosen, the called, and the faithful, they overcome the woman too. It's not just that Jesus defeats Rome. The Christians would defeat Rome as well because they're with Jesus. Let's finish out Revelation 17. 
And the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked, devour her flesh, burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kingdom of the earth. John says the waters represent the nations, multitudes, peoples, and languages. They actually keep Rome afloat. The people, the nations, the languages, as they pour into the Roman Empire, as they support the empire, they keep the woman afloat. The ten horns symbolize the power that the woman has, but eventually, if you notice verse 16, the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. The nations will eventually turn on Rome, and that's how Rome falls. If you read the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, she eventually falls because the nations that once pledged their allegiance will turn on Rome herself. And John saw that some 300 years before it happened. And the last thing is, oh yeah, what does this mean? Verse 17, God has put it into the hearts of the nations to carry this out. What does that mean? That God has put it into their hearts. How does God put it into the hearts of the nations to destroy the Romans? What does that mean? Does God throughout the Bible use wicked nations to do his will? Yes. Without violating anybody's free will, God allows nations to do what they'll do, and God uses them to do his will. He does it with the Assyrians in Isaiah 10. He does it with Babylon, and he does it here with the nations that will ultimately defeat Rome. And then he says, the woman is the great city. That's verse 18. The woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. All right, so that's Revelation chapter 17, the mystery of the woman that John saw and her ultimate fall. We've got five minutes, so let's just do chapter 18. Okay? The fall of Babylon. Babylon's fall is announced. That's Revelation 18, 1 through 3. Fall and fall in this Babylon. And if you read Revelation 18, 1 through 3, you'll just see the announcement of what was described in 17 carry over into 18. Another angel calls out for the people of God. So first call, Babylon's falling. But then in 18, 4 through 8, the call is to the people of God. If you notice the text, he says, come out of her. Don't be defiled with Babylon. Babylon's fallen, and the last thing God wants his people to do, maybe you've been a Christian for 30 years, and you're about to say to yourself, the next time the Roman guards come to my house and tell me to offer up a little incense to Caesar, I'm just going to do it. I'm hungry. I'm tired of giving in. I'm just going to go along. He says, don't do it. Babylon's fallen. Come out of her, my people. Don't be destroyed with Rome. When she falls, those who depended on Babylon will weep and wail as she sinks. The nations will eventually cry and lament Babylon's fall. And all they'll be able to do is reminisce on all that Babylon was before. Verse 9 says of chapter 18, The kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in the fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. Question. What is this single hour? What does that mean? Was this a literal 60 minutes? What is the hour for Babylon? What is he saying about Rome? <laughs> She's going to fall, but how? Somebody said it quickly. Quickly. It'll be quick. It'll seem like an hour. And such great, and one hour such great riches has come to naught, John says. Rome's fallen, but when she falls, it'll be quick. The business women and men lose their well being. This is the reason why people align with Rome. They were successful when Rome was successful. It was all about money. It was all about prosperity for them in verses 11 through 15. And now they're going out of business. The Christians that didn't receive the mark of the beast or any kind of affiliation with Rome, what weren't they allowed to do? Buy, sell, survive. And now Rome's going to see all of her riches, all of her prosperity come crumbling down. And not only Rome, any nation that's thrown in her lot. The destruction, destruction of all happens in an hour, Josh said a moment ago. That's quickly. That's correct. The people of God are encouraged to rejoice. Look at verse 19 and 20 of chapter 18. They threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying, Alas, alas, for the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given, given judgment for you against her. So the people of God are allowed to rejoice at the fall of Babylon and then an angel takes a stone and throws it into the sea as the chapter concludes 
and this is directly parallel to what happens in um, Jeremiah chapter 51, 59 through 64. In that chapter, Jeremiah describes ancient Babylon the same way as being thrown into the sea and sinking down to the bottom. And what John's trying to tell us in chapter 17 and 18 about Rome is the jig is up, the party is over, and Rome is on her way down. There'll be two more chapters about Rome's destruction, chapter 19 and chapter 20. I won't, we're going to be out of town for two weeks on that trip. I just want you to keep this in mind when we pick back up. I know people do this all the time. When we get to chapter 20, we just forget everything we've said and we're like, this is the end of the world. John says he saw a judgment, a great white throne. Forget everything Hiram says. Sounds like the end of the world. Revelation 21, coming down, jewels and all that. It's got to be heaven. I'm telling you, John doesn't change what he's emphasizing. All of this is about the destruction of Rome and her fall. Are there things that John says that apply to the end of the world? To heaven, no more tears. Not, of course they do. But in this context, for people who are under the thumb of Nero with his foot on their neck, the Domitian's reign, it meant everything to them, not for simply the end of the world, but that Rome was going to be their end soon and very soon. And it would seem like the final judgment. It would seem like they're cast into the eternal fire. But John doesn't fast forward to the end time judgment. John says, I saw everybody standing before God. Just think about that. Did John see John there? Are our lives this movie that's already played out? That's not what John's saying. He's saying Rome is on her way down, and it's the end of her world and her destruction. And it'll parallel exactly what we've seen in chapter 18. Thanks for a good Bible class. Thanks for